Today's reprise telecast of Celebration starring the Casimiro Brothers is sponsored by Bank of Hawaii, now with Christmas money to go. Your friends at Crazy Shirts, Ala Moana, Pearl Ridge, and Windward Mall. Frito-Lay of Hawaii, great tasting chips made fresh daily in Hawaii. Long's Drug Stores, make Long's a part of today. And by Miller High Life, the best beer for the best time of day. Welcome to Miller Time. The Monarch Room of the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. It hasn't changed much since Beverly Noah and I performed here back in the late 1960s. Aloha. I'm Ed Kenny, and welcome to Celebration, a portrait of two Hawaiians who presently call this famous Waikiki showroom their home, the brothers Casimero. Most of you have seen them in concert and listened to their records, but that's only part of the story of Robert and Roland Casimero. This new book, Celebration, written by Ron Ronk, takes us beyond the music and into the lives of these two talented performers. And tonight, we are going to do the same. The story of the brothers Casimero and their ohana is a celebration for Hawaii. Its history, its culture, and its music. So for the next hour, sit back and enjoy the sounds and the story of the brothers Casimero in celebration. I've always been the type of Hawaiian that never had to leave home to realize how lucky we are. It was never necessary for me to go to the mainland before I realized that what we have is special. If you're at the Royal, you're the best. To me, that's always been what I thought because whenever I went with Mama and Daddy to play cocktail music, the best were playing at the Royal. Ed Kenny, Marlene Tsai, Bev Noah, and so uh, I'm in pretty good company. In a life filled with music, all kinds of music, the path to the Monarch Room has been a carefully orchestrated one for the brothers Casimero. And it has been a path that they've been traveling for nearly all of the 25 years of their professional careers. The roots of the Casimero Ohana are firmly planted on the Big Island, but Robert and Roland grew up on Oahu 
in this modest home in Kalihi. Their father, Bill, and their mother, Betty, were musicians, and the brother's talent for music was evident from early childhood. From six years, they were playing already. That's how easy they were at playing music, you know. Oh, because Mama and Daddy were, um, were musicians, you know, they'd have practices here all the time. And so we, we were around music and dance and, and show people uh, all the time. And, um, and we sang constantly, you know, it was just part of waking up and breathing. During the early 1950s, Bill and Betty started their own band, Betty and her Lealojas. We were playing at the officers' clubs for the Marines, for the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Army, all, all the military uh, uh, sector. And then when we came to the, uh, the Chiefs Club, the CPO Club, that's where Roland began playing with us. Well, we had one bass player and he was always eating on the breaks. And when it was time to go to work, he wasn't quite there yet. Uh, the other bass player was making eyes at my daddy. That was a female bass player. And so um, Mama just decided to keep it in the family, real close to the family. So I got drafted. Betty and her Lealohas soon became a real family affair when Roland's twin sister Kanoi was added as a hula dancer and Robert joined the group as the piano player. I guess I was kind of frightened by it, you know, because but I was safe, see, I was behind the piano. And so it was like a little barrier between me and them. And the lights weren't that bright. And if I didn't want to look at anybody, I didn't have to. I just kept my head down. And whenever we were on breaks, I remember that we'd go in the back room and, and do our homework. But at the same time, it was fun, too, because, you know, you got to play music. The band played some Hawaiian music, but the popularity of the group rested on its dance music. We played all kinds of music. Uh, the rumba, the samba, and the walls, and what, whatever they wanted, we played. And people used to say, how can you keep up to the music? I said, it's because we love it. If we didn't, we wouldn't. But it's because we love it, and our children are growing, and they're picking up from us. To, you know. Their early childhood was different from many of their friends. Weekend nights were often spent in nightclubs. But in other ways, their upbringing was very similar to other families. We were basic like every other family. Growing up, we had sibling rivalries. We used to have Saturday <laughs> night matches, and Roland and I would complain, I want to watch this, he wants to watch that. And we'd fight over the TV set to the point where we'd get down and actually be in arguing and fighting and yelling and screaming and at blows. And Robert would come along and go, don't fight. And then we'd take sides and we'd beat up on Robert. So we were very normal. We screamed and yelled and hated one another. No matter what we are, we are a Music was the unifying force in the Casamero home, and their band continued as Robert, Roland, and Kanoi reached high school. The family was not well off financially, but to the brothers, it was never a concern. We were real lucky. Uh, Daddy worked for the Navy shipyard, and because of that, he met a lot of people, and that's how we got to work in a lot of those places, uh, down Pearl Harbor, you know. And they took care of us. They, they gave us food, they paid us, and uh, so Robert always has a, a thing he says, if we were poor, we didn't know it, because we were really uh, well taken care of. By now, the brothers were at Kamehameha schools. Robert was the student musical director, and both he and Roland belonged to the Concert Glee Club and the Hawaiian Ensemble, a group of 20 students organized by Nona Beamer. It was with her encouragement that Robert and Roland developed their serious interest in Hawaiian culture and dance. Nona Beamer was the teacher there for Hawaiiana, and for dance. And for years, you see, no one was allowed to stand up and dance at Kamehameha must have been missionary training. Ridiculous, but that's the way it was. And Nona was the first one to, um, I don't know whether she just did it or whether she got the permission to actually 
have us stand up and dance. You know, it was just unheard of as far as Kamehameha was concerned. Everybody else was dancing around town like it was nobody's business, but not at Kamehameha. And, um, and that Hawaiian thing became more important as the years went along. Robert's interest in the hula grew at Kamehameha School. In 1967, Kanoe introduced him to two people who would later play prominent roles in the Casamero story. The first was Lena Alahaini Kalama, a comic hula dancer who became a close friend and eventually joined the brothers on stage. The second was Mikey Ayu Lake, a kumu hula who accepted Robert as a student and graduated him from her class in 1973. Bill and Betty Casimero finally retired the family band, and Robert and Roland tried rock and roll. It was a fun experience, but a spark had been lit. So they started out with uh, rock and roll, you know, all this kind of stuff. But he didn't go with Robert. Robert is the uh, is kind of boy that wants something that uh, it comes from the heart, the inside of him. And he said, that's not for us. Let's get back to Hawaii. The way they did that was by joining a group that many feel was responsible for the current revival of interest in Hawaiian music and culture, Peter Moon and the Sunday Manoa. When we return, the Sunday Manoa years, good times, great records, and its much publicized breakup, and the beginning of the Brothers Casimero. The original Sunday Manoa recorded one album, Meet Palani Vaughn and the Sunday Manoa. The group consisted of Vaughn, Peter Moon, Cyril Pahinui, and Baby Kalima. After some personnel changes, the band had a new name, Peter Moon and the Sunday Manoa, and it had two new members, Bla Pahinui and Roland Casimero. The combination Peter, Bla, and I had was a neat musical combination. We couldn't sing that well. Peter couldn't sing at all. Bla had a vibrato that would shake down buildings, and I was soft, softer than a cat, and, uh, but the music, uh, we were hot. The combination got better when, uh, when, when Bla left the group and Robert joined. We were musically exciting, but we became vocally exciting. Only. Guava Jam was released in 1972. Its tremendous success is often used to mark the beginning of a renaissance in contemporary Hawaiian music. They paid homage to the roots, and yet they were adding modern things, modern conventions, so it, it became, I guess, an alternative to rock, and contemporary enough to appeal to young people. And certainly, in retrospect, I think Peter Moon and the Sunday Manoa brought a whole new awareness to a uh, an audience who might have not otherwise gotten hooked by Hawaiian music. The Sunday Manoa was Hawaiian music. Uh, it was jazzed up Hawaiian music, but it sparked the interest of a lot of people. It sparked uh, a renaissance as far as education for Hawaiian music, for Hawaiian language, and that's what we were after. It was Hawaiian music for young people. It was contemporary. It was lively, and they were performing it for local audiences. The Sunday Manoa was hot, and professionally, it was as high a time as the brothers ever experienced. It was great hearing myself on the radio for the first time as I was driving through Kapahulu across of Hale New. I was singing Only You. I wanted to get out of my car and tell every person that passed by that that was me singing on the, on the radio. Um, it was meeting some of the greatest people in Hawaiian music ever, ever, because we were part of the Sunday Manoa. Nina Kelly Ibahamana, Gabby Pahinui, the um, Sons of Hawaii, Eddie Kamai, Linda Dela Cruz, and Te Iolani Luahine. Uh, 
uh, Mikey Are You Lake. Um, it was fabulous to meet all these people. Gabby Pahinui, in fact, played on their next album, Crack Sea. It was at this time the Sunday Manoa started playing at the Primo Gardens in the Ili Kai, and then at the Prow Lounge in the Sheraton Waikiki. They were riding a crest of popularity, especially with young people, and played to packed houses. But looking back, things may have been going almost too well. Things were very, very comfortable for us at the time. There was no thought of growth because it was just too comfortable. It was at the point where we were drawing in people by the droves, I mean, you know, and there was no end to it in sight, or at least we didn't think so. So there was no need to practice or learn new songs or anything like that, you know. And Roland and I, pretty, I tell you, pretty, pretty much, we thought it was going to last forever. That was not going to be the case, however, and the brothers learned it the hard way. One night, everything came to an abrupt end when after a show at the Prow Lounge, Peter Moon decided that was it. He had had enough. We had a meeting uh, prior, prior to the breakup, and we, we asked him, you know, what was going on. And he said he would let us know, and he did. He said it was over. He just said, that's it. And that was it. He packed up his ukulele, and he walked out of the Prow Lounge. And that was it. <laughs> It was a highly publicized split at that time. There were many unanswered questions as to its cause, but according to Peter Moon, although there were some personal problems, the bottom line was he had grown tired of the Waikiki scene, performing five and six nights a week. He wanted to branch out into record producing and publishing, as well as concert promoting. The brothers, nevertheless, were stunned. I thought it was the end of the world. I mean, that was it. No more music, no more... No more presence, no more adoration, no more spotlights, no more concerts at the um, University of Hawaii Amphitheater. I mean, it was all gone. Pow, oh, that's it. And it scared me. We went into heavy depression. We started hanging out down at the Kiwala Basin lunch wagon. Um, <laughs> Ala Moana Park, anything we could do to eat, we were depressed. We just ate, we just, you know, toiled around. We just didn't know what to do. And a friend of ours came to our rescue, uh, Charlie Thompson. And Charlie said, uh, got somebody interested in you, Jack DeMello. And uh, we went. It was a pivotal meeting for Robert and Roland. They not only met and joined up with Jack DeMello, but also met his son, John, who would eventually take over their management. The music was alive and sassy and real contemporary and still just um, touching the essence of the culture and touching the essence of the musical values of Hawaii in Hawaiian music in the true sense. And it was a logical extension. And that's what uh, the, the very trigger that my father and I could see from a distance is that it was just a raw stone just sitting there. We didn't really know where we wanted the music to go. What was more important at the time was to let the music continue. Uh, it didn't necessarily have a goal. It, it just needed to be continued. We needed to be, um, to be heard, to let people know that we were still around. More importantly, who we were. Let me tell you a soft what Jack gave to us was that he, um, he let us be more in charge of, of the music, because there was no one else who could do it. You know, it was now Roland's job and my job to, to create this sound, to, uh, to make it our sound. And, um, that was our job, and that's what we did. After two albums with Jack DeMello and a triumphant return to the Prow Lounge, the brothers Casimero played their first major concert, the Full Moon Concert, in June 1977 to 8,500 people at the Waikiki Show. It was our first real big concert, you know, by ourselves. We couldn't believe it when there were so many people there. What a trip. I was so nervous. The transition from the Sunday Manoa to the Brothers Casimero was now almost complete. On stage, they were joined by hula dancer Lena Alahaini Kalama and by Roberts Halau, the men of Nakamale. 
Also, by the end of 1977, John DeMello had taken over their management and they began recording for his new Mountain Apple Company. It was neat. It was a neat growth period. It was hard because we lost a lot of our following. And only the diehards stayed with us. You know, the real diehards, and we had to rebuild all over again. But uh, all of that rebuilding was a lot of fun. With all that had transpired over the past few years behind them, the brothers could concentrate again on what they loved most, the music. Spurred on by the success of the Full Moon concert, they also set their sights on new projects, such as a salute to Lay Day. May Day is May Day in Hawaii. Happy May Day! May Day is Happy Day. Their Lay Day concerts have now been an annual event at the Waikiki Shell since 1978. It is the biggest show of the year for the brothers, and it is a day they feel is special for them and special for Hawaii. I believe in the fantasy that is supposed to be Hawaii. The, uh, the natives, the brown-skinned people um, at the beach, under waterfalls, uh, beautiful lays, paddling canoes, having big parties and luau's. And for me, that's what May Day is. Uh, we all want to hold on to that fantasy, that dream of, of what we would like Hawaii to look like and, and still be like. May Day is one of those outlets to um, live the fantasy. Hula has always been an important part of the Casimero experience. When they performed with their parents, there was always a hula dancer in the show. The hula was part of the cultural renaissance in the arts that took place in the early 70s. Robert and Roland spearheaded the contemporary hula revival by integrating Hawaiian dance into their live performances with both the Sunday Manoa and the Brothers Casimero. They feel the hula adds another dimension to their music. It expresses what the words mean with, with body gestures. Um, so like if I, because I know the language a little bit, I know that ua means rain, but you don't. But if you see a dancer up there going like this, you know that you have a choice of either rain or snow or something that's falling down from the sky, hopefully. Um, and so it's a plus to the music. It's great to see it performed in front of you rather than just listening to it. Perhaps if you would just heed our call. Their present hula dancer, Ala, is Kumu Hula for her halau, na puale o likolehua. Robert is also a Kumu Hula for his halau, the men of na kamalei. Both Ala and Robert are graduates of the late Mikey Ayu Lake's school of hula. When you talk about hula for me, the first person would be my Kumu, my teacher, Mikey. I call her Chiki, you know, she's my Chiki. And she taught me so much, and she allowed me to, to do so much in the hula, you know, that it, some things I know, you know, would not have been so easily accepted by, by many of the people in the community. But my teacher just took, Chiki just would say, if it makes you feel good and you're not hurting anybody, then do it. So I, as long as I knew I had her on my side, I was fine. Aho iu ka i ka ulu lehua, au au i ka ua kone ka ili. It was Maiki Ayu Lake's dream for Robert to have an all-male halau, an all-male hula school. In 1973, he graduated as a kumu hula from Halau Hula o Maiki and taught Hawaiian dance at Kamehameha schools. In 1975, he founded the men of Na Kamalei the first all-male halau in Hawaii since the 1940s. There was so much talk about my halau in the state because I enforced the use of the hips, of the movement of the hips. Now, you must understand, and I, and I believe this, that in American society terms, the movement of the hip is very feminine. And because we are so American society-minded in Hawaii now, 
uh, my boys and I, my gents and I, got a lot of flack about looking too feminine on stage because of that movement of the hip. But I, I have continuously fought for that, and we still do it our way. The Merry Monarch is the best known hula event in the state. Held annually during April in Hilo, it is the most intense hula competition in Hawaii. 1976 was the first year the Kane, or men's competition, was added to the festival. Robert and his former hula partner, Wayne Chang, brought Nakamale to the Merry Monarch that first year. Failing to win, they returned in 1977 to take first place in the men's modern hula division. The following year, they placed a close second. It was the last time Robert took Nakamale to Hilo. I stopped going to Mary Monarch because I just hated losing. I took it too personally. I must say though, I'm glad we went to Mary Monarch and I'm glad we lost because we learned so much from that lesson. It was a great lesson for us. And, and one of the most important things it taught me was that every performance you do is a Mary Monarch. Around the same time Robert and Nakamale were competing and winning in Hilo in 1977, Roland had branched off into a solo project of his own. He joined with some friends to form the Hokulea Band. The time Robert was spending with his halau was taking its toll on the brothers Casimero. I was having such a great time that I had forgotten about the brothers Casimero. I didn't realize it, but I had. And so when Roland gave me this ultimatum of, listen, either you give me more time, or as much time as you're giving your boys, or this, we call it quits right now, I was surprised, I was shocked. We ended up talking about it, and then Robert, Robert said, well, I'm real sorry, Fats. And I said, I'm sorry, too, and we decided to make the brothers work. But even though they reached an understanding, Roland continued with the Hokulea band. I thought, well, here I come back, and I, I give myself to this group, like how I'm supposed to, and he goes off. But then I thought, hey, you know, I had my chance to play, too, so it's his turn. The Hokulea Band recorded one album, The Musical Saga of the Hokulea, with Roland as composer and Kelly Itaua as lyricist. It tells the story of the canoe's historic voyage to Tahiti without the use of modern navigational equipment and its return to Hawaii as thousands greeted their arrival at Magic Island. The Musical Saga of the Hokulea was Roland's first serious attempt to interpret Hawaiian history through music. The boat to me means uh, Hawaii. It, it's great for the kids. It's a step to the past, and uh, I think uh, we ought to build a couple, ten thousand more. <laughs> I'm coming your way. I'm here to hurt and say, get out of my way. I'm a warrior. Roland's other solo albums have also dealt with Hawaiian history. Warrior is the story of King Kamehameha's rise from soldier to future king. The songs bring to light the human frailties of love, hate, and the fear of failure that even kings must endure. He wasn't only a king, he was a man. Uh, a man that, you know, no matter what he wanted, it didn't matter. His destiny was to unite the land. I tried to make him more of a man, stuff like uh, I'm looking at a new way of life. I'm looking at a new way to be. I'm living the future of man. This man is me. If instead of, you know, they just write of him as only the warrior. He was a man, but he was a bad warrior. <laughs> um, plus, you know, we got to play, uh, it's Hawaiian music, but I got to play. Doing these projects, I get to play rock and roll. You know, I, I don't have to worry about uh, Hawaiian words. I don't really have to worry about uh, you know, cha da 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 You know what I mean? I mean. You know, it's not. You know. Time and again, I ask myself it stands before me. You know, with Lee Rittenauer. You know. Uh, that's what I get to do when I'm not with Robert. I get to express the kind of music I want to play. And I love rock and roll.
Hawaiian legend states that the Big Island volcanoes are home for a number of fire gods. The most important of these is the goddess Pele, the inspiration behind Roland's third solo effort, the highly acclaimed Pele album. Madame Pele had long been considered a subject off limits for an album like Roland and John DiMello had in mind. Any commercial venture about the legendary fire goddess was bound to upset the purists. But they plunged headfirst into the project. Uh, I went to Kauai, I did research, I enlisted the help of people like Iolani Luahini, Vicky E.E. Rodriguez. You know, if you're going to do a project like that, you want some guns behind you. He also and came right now, here to the Mo'okini Heiau on the Big Island. Located in Kohala, it is the largest ancient temple of its kind in Hawaii and is a family heiau for Robert and Roland, restored and maintained by their cousin, Momi Lam. Whenever I start a project and I feel I need my grandpa's help, I come here and I ask grandpa to help us. And uh, sometimes he does, and I feel all the time he does. A lot of people don't find peace in these heiaus because they were sacrificial. Me, on the other hand, it's a part of me. It's a part of Hawaii, so I dig it. A lot of people don't get off of it, but I find peace, peace in it. Uh, brings me back to Grandpa and uh, the old Hawaii that I love. I think if I had to come back to Hawaii in any time, I would come back in this time. They had order. What was right was right. What was wrong was wrong. And if you're wrong, you're dead. If you're right, you were alive. And uh, <clears throat> this heiau is very special, uh, not only for me, but for the people of Hawaii. Every heiau is very important for us. I am the woman of the pit. All these projects is kind of mainly to look back at. Uh, a lot of people don't read, you know. The only reason I read so much about Pele and all this kind of stuff was because they're projects. Otherwise, I might not have read them. Okay? A lot of kids don't read, but a lot of kids listen to music. And if, you know, if they can get off on the music and they dig what I did with Pele, they're like uh, musical dictionaries. And if they want to go deeper, they can always go back to the source, to the books. I am everything you see. All this land out to the sea, I am Pele. I am Pele. I am Pele. Pele. The neighbor islands have long been a source of inspiration for the music of the brothers Casimero. When the subject of the big island comes up, the brothers talk of it in terms of their roots. Both parents were born and raised in Kohala, and many members of their family still live there. Waimea, in fact, is their favorite spot in the islands. It is the place they come to relax, to get away from the pressures of Oahu. It is also the place to visit those closest to them. My second son lives up there, and I go to the big island to relax. Hi, little pumpkins. I uh, try and get over here at least uh, once a month. Flying, uh, this is partly the reason, uh, besides coming up here to write, is to spend time with my family. I've done some of my best music here on this island, and uh, Waimea gives me a chance to get away from Honolulu, away from the telephone, away from uh, TV if I don't want it, just, you know, away, period and I just spend time uh, writing music. The brothers have also recorded an album on location in Waimea. In 1980, they brought their studio to this home in Kamuela. Well, this is Brown Sugar Ranch, owned by our friend Tippi, and this is where we did Hawaii in the middle of the sea. The kitchen, the most important room of all. And then, let's see, on this side, this is where John put Roland, isolated from pretty much the rest of the house. 
and he looked out into the living room here where I was and we could communicate non-verbally. The good thing about Roland being behind this glass was that his guitar didn't feed back into, the, uh, into my microphone here. My philosophy was to take this sterile environment which we're all, or all musicians are used to, of a studio which is usually a soundproof dark cave with carpetings on the wall, okay, that is soundproof and very um, cold. And then there's a giant window where the artist sits in one room and looks into another room of engineers and producers and people like that, and they're all talking, but the artist can't hear them. And if the artist has a complex, he's saying, are they talking about me, you know? And they, all this sterile kind of environment that it is established by the norm of recording music. I wanted to eliminate that. I wanted to make the process more invisible. The freedom is more wonderful, you know? I mean, um, you can, um you know that we, we're not paying strictly 10 hours to do this album, and it must be done within those few hours, you know. Here, we're here for a week. So, like, if you want to go to the beach and come back, if you want to go horseback riding up to Mana, or go over to Kalani Shudi's house and eat, you can. And then when you come home and you feel better, then you sing. And you use all of that, you know, the, 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 the taste of the food, the, the ride up, the ache of the purple, riding the horse, everything. It's just great. It is a formula they've been successful with one other time. Ho'ala, their best-selling album to date, was their initial try at location recording. They rented this beachfront home in Hanalei, owned by tennis star Billie Jean King. Both Kawaii and Ho'ala have a special meaning for the brothers. The whole album was an experience. If for no one else, but for us, and every time we hear the record, it takes us back to that time. We'd be sleeping at 4 o'clock in the morning, and, and all of a sudden, John would play the music, you know, like Puahone. He'd play that, and, and you could see shadows on the wall, and Allah would be dancing. and it was, it was really special. It became a real personal thing for us to do that kind of stuff. You know, we took up uh, the vans, we took up our cars, and for a week and a half, we lived with the people that we love, you know, they flew in, five would fly in, and then two days later, four would fly out, two more would fly in. It was a constant change of people, and it was a, a good fun way to record an album. It was also during Ho'ala they developed a new passion, helicopter rides along the Nepali coast. They were so moved by the experience, they wrote a song about it, entitled, These Hidden Valleys. It all started with a friend called Pierre, that had a helicopter, and he took us over the peaks, and you felt like you were a bird, and you were free. And you know, he took us into Waiale Ali, right up against the falls, you know, and cry. If you ever seen two Hawaiian boys cry over the beauty of Hawaii, that was me and Robert. I just wrote all the words down as I went. For, for every thing that we did on that helicopter for every turn, for every dive, for every climb. I wrote those words for those hidden valleys. It was wonderful. I haven't had an experience like that for a long time, I think. We love these islands and all that they share. Warmth, love, happiness, and time to care. Untold tales of times long past kings and queens of this and that. Trust in us and you'll know no cares. Throw back your arms and take to the have a story to tell us a secret wishes magic people and kingdoms gaze into the sea to know what life brings you power majesty and strength can you see through the barrier of years and the passing of ages know the meaning of what was is now ours to give and ours to show Share from the heart for the body and soul. 
Trust in us and you'll know no cares Throw back your arms and take to the air Fly until you know no boundaries Laugh a melody of joy and illusion Grab a sunbeam shining into the canyon Coloring the mountains over and over If you ever, if you ever, ever want to believe in The mysteries of glory that we speak of to you Look into the mirror of this life as we know it Come my friends, we'll take the best and we'll share it Trust in us and you'll know no cares Throw back your arms and take to the air And you'll know no cares Throw back your arms and take two Tropical baby, my little embers down at Waikiki. Your hips, they sway like the coconut trees. You're such a sweetheart to me. My tropical baby, your hair, your body always tickles me. To see you dancing right in front of me. It's always more than what the people see because the way you wink your eyes at me It blows my senses like the corner breeze Oh darling, open your eyes and see That I want you to belong to me My tropical baby for many years, Robert and Roland hesitated to play their music on a regular basis in Waikiki. They had built up a strong local following and feared they would lose it if they started performing primarily for a tourist crowd. After a few years of gradually making their way into Waikiki, they completed the transition in the summer of 1982, opening in the Monarch Room at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. We played in, in, in Waikiki. There were local spots, but... Uh, we, we really didn't want to play that uh, in tourist market. And uh, we are now, I, I don't believe we're real campy. You know, we're playing a campy Hawaiian show. A lot of the stuff that we do in the show is history, is culture, like boat day, like kahiko, like hapa haole numbers, putting them in the right perspective. I don't think when we wanted, you know, a while back, we could have done that. That's where I'm going, to the place where Understandably, I'm a local going. audience, I mean, a real local audience who perhaps came to see us when they thought we were the best in 1977 performing at the um, uh, Prow Lounge at the Alamuan Hotel. We were at that hotel for years, and we loved it. Those people who perhaps liked us better then um, find a great deal of displeasure in our show at the Royal now, understandably, because we're not doing that kind of local show anymore. It's just an old Hawaiian custom, 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 custom. When I say more and more, every year goes by, and every new show we put in, uh, more limits are taken off. Before, the show was 
three quarters uh, Hapa Haole, one quarter local, Hawaiian. Now it's half and half. Some shows you put on, it's three quarter Hawaiian, one quarter Hapa Haole number. So uh, it's working out, you know. Robert and I have learned to kind of uh, tailor the music to what we want. More and more tourists are coming, I feel, coming to Hawaii. They don't want to see the luau shows that, you know, pull their legs. If it's a good luau show, right on. But, you know, people are tired of seeing junk stuff. And so they were ready for a good Hawaiian show. And we were just lucky. And Robin and I have always been lucky to be there at the right time. You know, I don't know whether it But luck is only part of the explanation. They've also had the talent, the conviction, and the ability to take advantage of the opportunities as they arose. The brothers throughout their careers have been at the forefront of the rejuvenation of the Hawaiian culture. They are modern-day musicians with a strong link to a past they don't want forgotten. They have learned from the previous generation of Hawaiians and now pass that down to the present and future ones. Don Ho said once to me in a, in a private talk that he was congratulating us, us on extending the Hawaiian culture at least another 200 years. And I kind of leaned back and gasped. At, I, I didn't understand what he was saying, but I kind of realized what he was saying. Now we're helping the Hawaiian culture to live on past what its natural uh, position is now. We're extending it. We're contemporizing it. We're moving it on, and through the history of the islands, all the people that did that were leaders and did help extend it many, many years. Listen to the music we all have that's always playing right here in our hearts. what it's saying. It says we have... We made a decision, Roland and I, and John, we did it together, that we were not going to stay the same, that we were going to allow ourselves to change. We made a commitment that we would keep trying different things. We try not to go too far away from being Hawaiian, you know, and uh, <laughs> it sounds really weird. I know a lot of people will not agree with this, but Roland and I, I have this feeling that no matter what we do, it's still, whether it's in English or Pakistani or, or Chinese, it still sounds Hawaiian. The brothers, along with John, Allah, and the Halaus, now stand at a new threshold, a time of new goals. Yet they remain committed to the things that have been important and continue to be important to them. The culture, the history, the dance, the music of Hawaii. Our movement is here, music for the local people. And um, we are concentrating on that heavily all the time. We've never really lost too much focus on that. We want to make music for this community. We, and we love this place very much. And Robert gets homesick quickly and easily. Roland does too. Um, and even I do. We have tried to go to the mainland and stay for extended times a week or so, and it's just not worked. It gets, um, it gets crazy. Um, we want to um, music eyes right here and spend the rest of our lives right here making the sounds of uh, that we enjoy the most. Listen to the music we all have, it's always playing right here in our The old time musicians taught me about it a lot. Songs, you know, about their love for, for, uh, for the music. And so when Robert and I go somewhere and there's old musicians there, uh, to see them smile knowing that these young kids are singing the right words, are playing the music correctly, and are taking that Hawaiian music a step further. That's, that, that makes it all worth it, you know, when, when you please these people that taught you. And uh, my son loves, you know, men at work, and he loves Sting and all those guys, but my two boys love Hawaiian music. You know, that, that's what it's all about, passing it on to the kids and making the old people feel like, hey, we do have a handhold on it. You know, we're not just flaking off and, you know, killing the music, you know, we're trying to do something. Listen to the music, we all have it, so it's playing right here in our hearts.
Today's retelecast of Celebration starring Robert and Roland Casimero has been sponsored by Bank of Hawaii, now with Christmas money to go. Your friends at Crazy Shirts, Ala Moana, Pearl Ridge, and Windward Mall. Frito-Lay of Hawaii, great tasting chips made fresh daily in Hawaii. Long's Drug Stores, make Long's a part of today. And by Light Beer from Miller, everything you wanted in a beer and less.